When he was um, uh, awarded a knighthood, he was reluctant to take it, but he uh, felt that he, he ought to for the sake of the team. Uh, a modest, humble man, he'd often be seen walking around in sandals in the coffee room, even though he was director of the Sanger Institute, so very down to earth and a great, uh, as I get the word passionate always comes to mind when I think of him, but he'd be willing to convey his love of the subject and the power of what the human genome could do. And everybody uh, hugely impressed obviously by his work at the time, but the impact of what he discovered, it, we're, we're all going to benefit from this for, for years, aren't we? We're, well, we're already benefiting. We've got a whole new generation of medicines. And I think the transformation is sort of like, we now know how the nuts and bolts of the human body actually work. It's like the discovery of atoms. Once we discovered atoms, we could explain all sorts of things about the things around us, the universe, and in the same way, the discovery of what makes you, you, and me, me, will tell us an awful lot about how life works. We end here tonight with one of the wonders of the universe. His name was Stephen Hawking. Hawking died today at his home in Cambridge, England. He was 76. I study the marriage of space and time. His life story portrayed in the 2014 film, The Theory of Everything. Oh, okay. Again, Brian Greene. It's kind of amazing that Stephen Hawking was born 300 years after the death of Galileo to the day. And he died on Einstein's birthday. His physical limitations had, he said, freed his mind to develop brilliant new theories on the origins of the universe or on what actually happened in space's black holes. His 1988 book, A Brief History of Time, became a bestseller and made him an unlikely international celebrity. He also made several cameos on the Big Bang Theory. His was a brilliant mind in a severely damaged body. Stephen Hawking overcame the loss of working limbs and his own voice to become the best-known theoretical physicist of his era. Although my body is very limited, my mind is free to explore the universe, to go back to the beginning of time, and into black holes. There are no limits to the human spirit. All my life, I have sought to understand the universe and find answers to these questions. I have been very lucky that my disability has not been a serious handicap. Indeed, it has probably given me more time than most people to pursue the quest for knowledge. Why was he so brilliant? What was the central thing about Hawking? Well, I think the public saw him as a messenger from the stars. You know, the stars are in our dreams. We look up in the night sky, we see all these stars, and we wonder, what does it all mean? Where did it come from, the universe, and where is it going? And here was a man, not since Einstein, who could communicate to the public about the meaning in the universe itself. Cosmic questions that we all think about at night. But uh, <laughs> Hawking was interviewed more recently by the Guardian newspaper, mm -hmm. and uh, he made this statement that heaven is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. I don't know whether you've come across yes. this. And I was asked to respond to it. And I said, well, if you want a one-liner at that level, then atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. Solston's defining moral code was inherited from his father, a vicar. I think above all I, I did get from him a, a strong moral sense of, uh, of right and wrong, but, but I'm not a believer, and, and it was a struggle. Um, I've kept his, his moral uh, pressures quite clearly. At Cambridge, Solston read chemistry, but he was a mediocre student. I wasn't a, a model student, and I found really all the learning a bit of a drag at that stage. You know, I was going out drinking with, the, with my friends and all the rest of it and it takes time and then and then you get a bit behind. In 1969 Solston joined the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, a scientific hothouse which has spawned 13 Nobel Prizes to date. He joined a project started by Sidney Brenner with whom he now shares the Nobel Prize. Brenner was looking at the development of a species of nematode worm, a parasite which lives in compost heaps. It was hours spent at the bench with this laboratory animal 
that led Sulston to the Nobel Prize and to the holy grail of his scientific generation. Sulston set about charting the cell's lineage, seeing which part of the worm each cell was to become. What set him apart was his simple insight. He realized he could do it just by drawing each stage of that lineage as it happened. So the worm, like, like us, starts from a single cell. Now, in our case, we're made up of a hundred million million cells. The worm is made up of only about a thousand cells, and so it is actually a, a possible and finite task to find out where every one of those cells comes from. And it's a meaningful task because cells, for example, have choices. You have two cells like this, and one's going to go that way and then the other that way, or it could be that one goes that way and that one that way, you see. So you, you, you can work out these branch points, these choices. It's really an astonishing thing because most people, if they said, well, the universe creates itself from nothing, the average person would think, oh, that doesn't make any sense. But there's something about the stature or the aura around Stephen Hawking that reasonable people give him a free pass. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that Stephen Hawking clearly, I mean, he's arguably the most famous living scientist. He is a genius. Mm -hmm. I, I was at Cambridge just a bit behind him. Mm. I, I remember him walking around in Cambridge in those early days. And I think the trouble is, and it, to be fair, it applies to me as well, we've got to be careful as scientists when we go outside our own field. Mm. And I just think that Hawking has not checked with philosophers. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is that if a person is a famous scientist, particularly, mm -hmm. science has such a cultural authority at the moment mm. that they think that every statement of a scientist is a statement of science, mm -hmm. and it very frequently isn't. And I think that's where we need to be extremely careful. Absolutely. I mean, this is for discerning and informed citizens the task of distinguishing uh, the philosophy that is often sewn in with the content of science and distinguishing one from the other. It's a hard task, and a lot of non-scientists feel incompetent to do that. Yes, and feel intimidated about it. I think my chief objection, though, to what Hawking and Dawkins and co. are doing is this false alternative, offering people a choice mm -hmm. between God and science. Mm. Now, that seems to be a mistake, but it comes from the fact that they have assumed that God is a God of the gaps. Mm -hmm. So the more science increases, the less space there is for God to dwell. Right. And if you think of God as, as that, mm -hmm. then of course you'll say, people, you have to choose between between God and science. Sure. But that certainly isn't the Christian view. In fact, it isn't the view of any sensible person that I've ever met. Right. God is the God of the whole show. And to offer people a choice between God and science as explanation is like offering people a choice between Henry Ford and mechanical engineering <laughs> as an explanation for a Ford motor car. Absolutely. In order to explain it completely, you need both an explanation in terms of science, law, mechanism, mm -hmm. and in terms of agency, Henry Ford. And it's the same with God and the universe. And that seems to me to be so elementary. And yet, because because of the immense scientific prestige, mm. people feel, well, we've got to choose between God and science. And of course you don't. Well, you don't. And it's funny because it's this really a fairly recent innovation in science. I mean, you mentioned Isaac Newton, who, of course, was perfectly happy to make both, both mechanistic and mathematical explanations, and nevertheless to infer back to a first cause, which he says is most decidedly not a mechanism. That's one of the greatest uh, scientists of all time, had no problem doing this. Well, it's, it's, it's even stronger than that, I think. It was the belief in God and a designer behind nature that actually was the motor that drove the rise mm. of science in the first place. And I feel it's very important to remind people of that bit of history because it is so important.
Oh, absolutely. It's funny because if you open up an astronomy textbook, for instance, you'll usually get a chapter on the supposed history of science. And in fact, I've often said that the sort of materialist ideology that some people adopt in science, people like Richard Dawkins, are dependent very much on this materialist rewriting of the history of science. And so in some ways, the, the best way, to, I think, to inoculate people against these bad ideas is to just inform them of the... Oh, the it origins. is indeed, and also perhaps to inform them of Joseph Needham's attempt to understand the lack of modern science as we know it in the Chinese culture, because Needham was a chemist and an expert on China, but he was also a Marxist. Mm. And he tried to explain the difference. Why is there science in the West and mm -hmm. why is there no science as distinct from technology in China, effectively? Mm -hmm. And in the end, he came to the conclusion, as a Marxist, that the only difference he could detect was the Chinese did not have the unifying concept of a creator mm. who created the universe according to a particular design and plan. And that, he said, is a Marxist. So the negative side is interesting <laughs> as well. That's wonderful to have that from Needham. No one would accuse him of being a Christian exactly. propaganda. Exactly. Well, exactly. you mentioned, of course, the idea of a multiverse. I mean, it's funny because Hawking's quote about the universe creating itself from nothing got most of the play and is the, probably the most implausible thing he said. But, of course, the, the multiverse is sort of now the most popular way of getting around some telltale evidence of so-called fine-tuning. And what do you think of this multiverse idea? Well, I suppose I'm a bit biased because I was taught quantum mechanics at Cambridge mm -hmm. by Professor Sir John Polkinghorne, <laughs> and Polkinghorne is extremely sceptical mm -hmm. of it. But it's very interesting that Hawking comes across with this as if his M theory mm -hmm. connected with multiverses was really the theory of everything that, mm -hmm. that people are looking for, and yet his co-author and equally eminent mathematician, in my opinion, Sir Roger Penrose, mm. thinks he's overreached entirely and, mm -hmm. and feels that this M theory isn't really even a theory. Now, I'm not an expert in these fields, but again, I step back and say that even if multiverse theory is true, mm -hmm. again, we have these people facing us with a false alternative, right. either the multiverse or God. But can't God create more than one <laughs> universe if he wants to? And philosophers have not been slow in pointing out right. that there's an illogicality here. But of course, since the other universes aren't accessible to mm -hmm. us, it does remain in what I'm tempted to call the mythological realm. <laughs> it's at least suspicious. It seems very strange to look at something, some evidence that I would say looks like a fine-tuning. It looks fine-tuned perhaps because it is fine-tuned. And on the basis of that evidence to appeal to this vast ensemble of other universes, just to sort of inflate the resources for chance, it seems quite ad hoc to me. It does seem very suspiciously ad hoc, and if you add to that the fact that there's no evidence mm -hmm. of these and so on. I have a good friend who is a philosopher of physics in Oxford and, and an atheist, and he actually didn't feel that the fine-tuning argument was affected by the multiverses mm. at all, because very frequently we're talking about the fine-tuning within this universe, right. you see. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know... I just am not impressed with it. Mm. And I still think, and it's very interesting that mm -hmm. Hawking spends so much time in his book, he calls it the grand design, yes. because he's impressed with what very much looked like design. And I think he presents quite a good argument <laughs> when you take the negative sides that actually it is the result of intelligent causation. Well, it's an exciting time to be alive, to have access to this oh, evidence. Oh, absolutely. It's fascinating. Well, I wanted to talk about your recent book on Stephen Hawking. Many of the listeners will know that Hawking had a book out uh, last year called The Grand Design. I guess someone told him the word design uh, sells books. And if you read the book, this is sort of his latest thinking on these questions in cosmology, especially as they relate to theology. And in fact, I think every English-speaking newspaper in the world reported on this book and some of the sort of things that he said, some great sort of sound bites. But you've written this little book responding to Hawking called God and Stephen Hawking, Whose Design Is It? Anyway, and I enjoyed this book. It's a small book. It, in my opinion, says all of the main things that need to be said in response to Hawking. But what made you decide to write the book? Well, first of all, I was invited to write an op-ed piece for one of the major 
English daily newspapers mm -hmm. on this. And when I started, I just kept writing. <laughs> and it turned into a book once I'd seen what Hawking was actually saying. The famous quote that perhaps everyone has heard is this statement along the lines of, because there are laws such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. In fact, I saw an LA Times reporter that responded to this by saying, well, this is something that must be believed, but not understood. <laughs> well, I think I would put it more strongly than that. I, I would say that it can't be understood because it's self-contradictory. And it was that actual statement that amazed me when you put it together with his initial page one statement that philosophy is dead. Right. And then he and his co-author continued to write a book on philosophy and prove, I'm afraid, that as far as they're concerned, philosophy very much is dead. <laughs> but that statement was incredible because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. The first obvious thing to say about it is, well, a law of gravity isn't nothing. Right. And a law of gravity without gravity would be meaningless. <laughs> so that's the first self-contradiction. Yeah. The second is that the universe will create itself. If I say X creates Y, what I mean in English is that I presuppose the existence of X to explain the existence of Y. Mm -hmm. So if I say X creates X, then I'm presupposing the existence of X to explain the existence of X. And what that shows to me is that if you put X equal to the universe, <laughs> it shows that nonsense remains nonsense, even a famous scientist talk it. Well, this is, you know, this is the dilemma of not studying perhaps any philosophy. I'll say that as a philosopher, of course, Hawking at the very beginning of his book is violating one of the sort of basic rules of reasoning that from nothing, nothing yeah. comes. And I'm actually glad that he said philosophy is dead at the beginning of the book because it brought a lot of philosophers out of the woodwork who uh, have helped dis <laughs> dismantle. Oh, it has about. done, particularly on the continent, particularly in the German speaking world. But uh, <laughs> Hawking was interviewed more recently by the Guardian newspaper. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made this statement that heaven is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. I don't know whether you've come across yes. this. And I was asked to respond to it. And I said, well, if you want a one-liner at that level, then atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light.